suppose. Now we've got these three more little things, and they're really more like discussion. So basically all of the hands-on is done for the day. Uh, we have this extra discussion, and then tomorrow we arrive and we get more hands-on with the scaling things. So the array jobs, the parallel, and the GPU. But for the meantime, we have these three things. So software modules, data storage, and remote access to data. So it used to be we would talk about these first in the day. So we'd end up spending basically like half the time just talking about software and data and so on, which are really important, but is a really like unique to each person kind of thing. So now we're instead giving a quick summary and you can read it yourself. And we think that will have a better outcome overall. So should we begin? Um, software modules. So Simo, I see your screen is shared. So let's go yeah. there. So you saw yes. me try to use the module command to when I did module load lamps before. So Simo, what is module and why? Yeah, so so basically what I also on the day before uh, tried to explain uh, with maybe limited success about software is that like there's so many different softwares that people can use. Uh, so many different things that people can use. Whoops, pressed the wrong button. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, there's so much software that everybody has their own software. Like uh, there's lots of stuff that people want to run. So we have these modules, software modules, like uh, that we install software in, and uh, you can basically load these modules. So we don't have software installed into the machines themselves. The software is installed uh, installed somewhere else. So uh, you can load it though. So for example, like let's look at this uh, type along here. Like you can try it yourself. Like where is MATLAB? So if we look at where is MATLAB, there's no MATLAB because like there's no one version of MATLAB. There's multiple of versions of MATLAB. And not, not everybody wants to have MATLAB available constantly. So if we um, run module spider MATLAB, uh, what Richard was running previously, this module spider command, you can see that there's like uh, multiple versions of MATLAB available. Uh, so you can see that there's like from 2012 to 2019, because like some software doesn't necessarily work with the newer versions and some software needs the newest version. So we have uh, options for people. And then you can load uh, uh, MATLAB. <laughs> and after you module load something, you you uh, you can find it that there is suddenly like a MATLAB available. So this which command tells yeah. that where is this command MATLAB. So now, now there's a MATLAB available. And, and these like there's lots of software and it's provided via this module system. Uh, and basically, if you just module spider a name of the software, you might find it, you might not find it. You might want to ask us to install it for you. Uh, but but basically, there's a huge bunch of software, and we cannot go through all of them because there's so many of them. But in the applications page, there's many of them listed, and uh, your site might have its own applications installed. But, yeah. uh, but basically, there's lots of software already a present in the system that are installed for everybody because like everybody uses them yeah. so uh, so but but yeah like rich said it's no point to go through all of this because it's so unique like it depends completely on your workflow some people compile their code some people use matlab some people don't use python and it, they they you might find your different modules and different things to find out mm -hmm. Uh, but but it, the main idea is to know that there is such a thing. Like there is, there are software available via modules, and you can get it uh, loaded into your environment. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's basically the main point here. You can find the quick reference of the different commands down below. Um, 
maybe we can go on. To yeah, the and if you one. want to know how the sausage is made, it's also down there. But like, yeah, like yeah. you don't necessarily want to know, <laughs> at least, uh, or if you don't feel like uh, looking yeah. through it. So I would say let's go on, and we'll answer all Q and A's about all of these at the end. So the next is data storage. Yes. And now this so, is a big uh, one. Yeah. So the data storage is is like each site has their own data storage, but like if you remember from the uh, from the talk, there is usually in a cluster there is some data storage. So in in Alta we have a Lustre parallel file system. In Helsinki University they have a Lustre parallel mm -hmm. file system. I'm not completely uh, familiar with other sites have, but but nevertheless there is a data storage to use when your jobs are running. Mm -hmm. So uh, in you can access it through the work directory environment mm -hmm. variable that should be set. You can you can go there into your uh, yeah. into your work folder. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll use the so, CD dash to yeah. go back, but. So, yeah, so, so basically there is a place for your data, but, but it's not the only place for our data. Yeah. Can you tell me why don't we have one place for all data? Why do we need different types of places for different types of data? Yeah, so, so there's uh, basically the idea usually is that you have this one file system, like you cannot have a file system that is under backup, is large and is fast at the same time without it costing like costing a lot of money so so usually uh, you have to do compromises and these cluster file systems are usually large and fast but they're not under backup so if you have like some finished products or finished uh article or finished like or important experimental data that you want don't want to lose those should be in a different file system but you can always have a copy of the data in the in the cluster file system for for like doing analysis but like their cluster file system usually isn't meant for like uh, long-term storage or something like that. It's a work directory, so it's it's like a it's not meant to uh, it's not a gallery where you show your paintings. It's like a painter's uh, house mm -hmm. where everything is uh, like can be messy and mm -hmm. and and under work, but it's yeah. not yet like under the plexiglass uh, yeah. in a gallery. So so it's like. It's a like it's a place where you work. So uh, you should always like uh, in, in different universities. There's different places, and there's huge bunch of places where you can store your data. In in like some places have uh, different uh, sizes. Some places have different speeds. Some places have different mm -hmm. backup schedules. Uh, you should de determine which yeah uh, how important your data is. Uh, like where you want to store it. Yeah. Do you want to like show so each site should have some sort of table that describes everything, which I think is down below here. Mm, um, yeah, here we go. Available data storage places. So this shows um uh, the name, the path of it, the size, is it backed up, where is it available, and so on. And there's also like this hierarchy. So the things that are, well, so some of them, like the smallest ones, like the local storage, well, actually this is not quite correct. So they all have different speeds also. So for example, the largest ones are everywhere and is really fast, but not backed up. and Things like your home directory are really small, but it is backed up. There's yeah, so so usually it's 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 good idea to to uh, there's there's documentation here uh, in the wiki on like data management policies. There's a whole whole like chapter on it, but uh, so, so it's usually a good idea to like separate your data conceptually what is like so you might have a situation where you have like some original data let's say some some important data that that like actual experiments had to be done to get it that might be that it's it's stored under like a backed up system but it, the data might be still like tens or hundreds of gigabytes and mm -hmm. then you might have a 
copy of the data in the work directory uh, and then you might have like additional like modifications of the data when you do like experiments or stuff like stuff like that so you might end up with like a terabyte of data or something like something of that sort in the scratch uh, work directory mm -hmm. but at the same time you might have code that is uh used to analyze the data and the size of that code might be a few megabytes mm -hmm. but it's very important that you have it under like a correct system because that code is is your thoughts basically it's it's your thoughts made uh, made flesh like or made made text mm -hmm. so that should be some in some version control system like that is that is the most important thing because that's what you use your time on. Like mm -hmm. the data just hangs around there until the code comes and does something with it. So that should be in a version control system. So it's it's good idea to have like this kind of a like which part of this data is is uh, in what sense? Like how much time would I need to use to recreate the data mm -hmm. from scratch? Like some experiments, you cannot replicate them without like actually like doing the experiments themselves but some like data analysis things you can do it in like let's say in a week so if you lose a week's work worth of job that or weeks worth of time that's bad but it's not in it's like small peanuts compared to like uh like actual like writing a, a piece of analysis code or something which might take you months or years even mm -hmm. so it's it's good idea to separate these th yeah. things and like store your code in a version control system your important data that needs to be archived and original data in some sort of system with a backup and then everything else uh, like in a work system where everything can be yeah. messy okay um hmm. There's a good question from HackMD. When should you use your home directory and when should you use your work directory in practice? So like practically speaking, is it based on size or type of data or what? Like I, I personally use the home directory mainly for only, no, only for like configuration files, like stuff that mm -hmm. uh, that is still like, like some, because like many, many programs point to the home directory by default for for storing like configuration files. So it's usually like the home directory is best for those because like if the configuration files, if there's some problem with with the, with the file system, like if the configura if the home folder is missing, you cannot usually log into anywhere, or like nothing works. Mm -hmm. So the home folder is that's, that's why it's separate system because yeah. uh, like in, in the, in the case where the file system is, is down or something, uh, that rarely happens, but in those cases, you still have access to the system. So yeah, but the, like the home folder is like mainly mainly for configuration files, and that's why it's so small. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what else is there about data? I guess the main summary here is really think about your data storage. Read what's on this page. And um, yeah, yeah, and especially if you're going to be doing, um, let's say, some data intensive work like deep learning or stuff mm -hmm. like that, you really should take into account the data and how where the data comes from, because like uh, the, the data can really become like this kind of a bottleneck if the data is not uh, loaded fast enough. We'll talk about this a bit more in the GPU yeah. when we talk about GPU jobs, but yeah. but like data, data should be where you're doing the computation. That's why we have the hot, like the big mm. disks in the system. Like it should be accessible to the machine itself that does the computation. And that's why we have this kind of a work directory. Yeah. Okay. So next up is the remote access to data. And this is important because not only are you doing stuff on the cluster, but you also need to usually move data back and forth. So it might be moving a big bunch of data to Triton once when you first start doing your work, which is, I mean, if you're doing it just once, it doesn't matter how hard it is. But there might also be things like the visualizing the data where you're doing it basically every few um like you know many times a day you're looking at figures or running another script that will um 
visualize it live and stuff like that. And for this, we have two main options. So one is transferring data, which is like running one program that moves it and makes a copy on the cluster or on your own computer. The other option is remote mounting, which is basically mount is the term for making some data or storage device available. So basically what you can do is take your own laptop or um, it's automatically done on Alto desktop computers. So on your own laptop, you can run some commands and then the data on Triton is available right there on your laptop. No copies needed. So you open a file and then you, like your computer goes, gets it from Triton, gives it to your program. If you modify it, it goes and modifies it on Triton and so on. So this is really convenient for small, quick things like looking at figures or stuff like that. It's not great yeah, for if you, efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So if you consider like, again, this, this kind of a workflow that you have that like you, you put, you put code into the system and you put maybe some big data into the system and it goes through the computation and stuff. And then you want to see the output of it is the output the exact same data that you put in there most likely not most likely like when you're doing some analysis the end result can be described like okay that did the physics code did i get a minimum energy state or something like did i get a small number here like what was the end result number here or you can get like a graph or something or like a mm -hmm text file that describes like uh, how the system was behaving like some graph is going down and some graph is going up and and usually it can be described by a few uh, numbers because like that's what you probably put into the article anyways like you cannot put a 10 gigabyte data file into an article <laughs> that needs to fit few pdfs so yeah. so you need to have some sort of like visualization for it anyways so most like uh, in many cases it's useful to like a run some visualization maybe in the cluster or or some some sort of like data reduction thing like you calculate a mean or you calculate a uh, standard deviation or you do some statistical analysis or something uh, to reduce the complexity of the data so that you can then visualize it easily mm -hmm. uh, and then you don't have to transfer that much data when you do the uh, work from home or from uh, afar you only need to transfer that small amount of data that describes what the analysis did Yeah. So the downside with mounting is that it's not very efficient. So basically, if you're accessing a big file, then every time you're accessing it, it's being transferred over the network. So small things like plots and stuff like that, sure. Big things like gigabytes of data files go to the cluster and access it there. Mm. Yeah, it's it's basically like like if you consider like like that the cluster is this kind of a restaurant where stuff is being done and mm -hmm. stuff is happening and and somebody's eating their spaghetti in a table and if you ask them that is the spaghetti good and they answer like through a window or through a doorway that yeah it's pretty good mm -hmm. then you can be like okay like the job is doing but if you ask them like okay can you like bring me the spaghetti like I want mm -hmm. to get it and they try to bring it through the window. Like it's it's it gets complicated really fast. Like if you need to ex inspect every <laughs> everything yourself, uh, if you don't yeah. just like, you, it's better to usually just like look at the end products instead of that transferring the whole data set and everything uh, through the mount. Yeah. So with that being said, have we answered the three things here, or at least I think we provided you enough to read yourself and ask more questions if needed yeah i'll quickly mention that there are other like tools that we are working on like jupiter we have a jupiter system in alto and and we are also working on enabling this open on demand system so that you can have like some sort of a bit more usable interface uh, but there are many workflows mm -hmm. that you can use to do work but the main main thing is that like usually you you write some code and then you submit it into the queue the code does it 
the uh, what you have told it to do. You, it runs there on the background. You go for a coffee break. You come back. The code is done. You transfer maybe some one CSV file or something that describes your output, and then you visualize it on your laptop, and then you are happy that you managed to do the stuff without your laptop burning. So uh, that's that's how people usually do. But they, we cannot tell one workflow. Uh, that works for everybody because there's so many different kinds of problems that people are solving. Yeah. 